Hallelujah. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for worship, for the ability to have worship in our hearts for you, Lord. We thank you that your presence is here. We thank you that you are moving in and through our lives, even in this moment, Lord Jesus. I pray today that you remove every distraction. Lord, I pray that you make us a fresh soil right now, that you remove everything that's hindering us from receiving a word from you today. Lord, I pray for forgiveness in our hearts, that it would just move everything that's been causing us struggle and strife and let it move out of our lives right now in this moment, Lord. Today, Lord, we commit this service to you. Lord, I ask that it not be my words that they hear, but your words through me, Lord. That you use me as a vessel today. That as this word goes out, Lord Jesus, it would be heard by ears that want to hear and receive a word from you, Lord. I pray that there ain't going to be no rock crying out in our place, Jesus. That there is no other kind of worship that can take the place of what your glory deserves, Jesus. So today, Lord, I pray that you speak to us in this moment. Lord, we yield ourselves to you and we listen to what you have to say. Speak, God. Speak to us. Speak through us, Lord. Let this be fertile soil, Jesus. We give you this whole service, Lord Jesus. Have your way. All honor and glory be to you, Jesus. In your mighty and matchless name we pray it. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. God's too good for us to be sad, amen? I'm excited. How many of you are excited to be in the house of the Lord today? Come on. With a worship set like that, in the midst of anything that could go wrong in your life, if you can't worship like that, you know, it's funny because I don't always have music when I worship. Worship isn't always about having music. You can sing right where you are. The, the joy of your heart should be the praises that come out and give glory to God. Whether we had music up here or we didn't, thank God we did because they're amazing, our worship team is, right? They help us usher in the presence, but you can do that right where you are. But if you're too proud, if you're too afraid, if you're too worried about what other people think, a rock will cry out in your place. And I heard him say, don't ever let a rock cry out in your place. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Wow. Whew. You guys ready to do this today? I'm pumped because this word, this word is challenging. This word this word speaks to me because I, I, I feel that too many times we don't realize which person we are that we're reading about. You see, you hear a story told and you don't know if you're the person telling the story or if the story's about you. And so in the verse that we're going to be reading from today, Proverbs 24, verses 30 through 34, it says, I went by the field of the lazy man. See, I want to be the one walking by the field. I don't want to be the lazy man that they walk by. Okay, three of you want to be the people that walk by. Let me say that again. I went by the field and I want to be the one that went by the field. Amen? You see, it says, I went by the field of the lazy man and by the vineyard of the man devoid of understanding. That means without understanding. You see, you have to understand something that... When you walk into something and you try and do it, if you don't know what you're doing, you might mess up, right? So that's why you become lazy. This is why you need instruction and preparation, which I'm gonna get to. And there it was, all overgrown with thorns. Its surface was covered with nettles. Its stone walls 
were broken down. And when I saw it, I considered it well. Not considered it good. He considered it well. He thought about it. This is what he says. That I looked on it and received instruction. Did you know that when you see something, you can receive instruction without hearing it? Amen? That's why people say that your actions speak louder than your words sometimes. So what are your actions telling people? I looked on and I received instruction that a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, so shall your poverty come on like a prowler and your need like an armed man. Hmm. Proverbs 24, 27 says, prepare your outside work, make it fit for yourself in the field, and then afterward, build your house. Did you hear what it says? I'm going to build my house. You could build your house on my worship. I didn't even know we were singing that. It's like you guys knew my verses. You just chose songs. I know how it is. It's never like that. Isn't that amazing how God puts it together for us? He already sets the stage for us. He puts us in the moment, in the mindset. But you have to prepare your field to make it ready to build. Amen? And then it says this, and this is right when Jesus is out on the Sermon on the Mount, he, he comes to the mountainside and he sees all these people and he decides to start preaching to them. And he starts teaching them. And as he's teaching them and he's saying all these things and he gets done saying them, he then says, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine, that means we got to be what? Hearers of the word. And does them. Then we have to be what? Doers of the word. I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended. And the floods came and the winds blew. And they beat on that house. And it did not fall. For it was founded on the rock. Somebody say, I'm founded on the rock. Amen. Then verse 26 says, but everyone who hears these things of mine and does not do them, say, I'm not going to be that guy, that person. Because you know why? Then you're listening to which one of these are you? Are you going to be the wise builder or are you going to be the foolish builder? Because they will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the same rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell. But I like this next part. Why? Because it reminds us that we need to be humble in everything because it says, and great was its fall. You may be seated. You guys, you guys look great. I'm going to try my best. I'm smelling cookies. How many excited this? Cookie Sunday. Come on. Amen, amen. So I decided I'm going to read from the Bible a little bit. I brought my digital Bible. How many of you guys have your digital Bible with you? I'm going to be reading from New King James Version. We just, we're reading from there. But it's funny because I said I found this so interesting that when Jesus was speaking at the Sermon on the Mount, he said some key words over and over and over again. And I've read it numerous times. How many of you guys read your Bible? Good thing the lights are on. I can't see everybody. No, I'm just joking. I know you guys read your Bible, especially you online. And it's true. I don't always read my Bible, and I find it so sad that when I read it again and again, that it just pops off the page, and I said, man, I got something fresh from it today. How come I don't always do this? So I started challenging myself. I'm going to start reading my Bible more. I'm going to start going into my Word and not just doing a devotional here and there. Amen? How many of you are going to start reading your Bible more? Let's start reading the Bible. These are the days that we need to know what God is saying to His people. Amen? But see, I found it so interesting because when He was speaking in the sermon, He kept saying this, you have heard that it was said. You have heard that it was said. See, somebody said something, and you heard it. And it's the way that you've always heard it. You don't understand what I'm saying? There's something that was always said from the beginning, and it's the way that you've always understood it to be. And then he would go on and tell them what that was. You see, 
He's reading there. He says, blessed are these who come together, who come and mourn, and this and that. He's going over the Beatitudes. And then all of a sudden from there, he goes in and he says this, you are the salt. And if it loses its salt, then it loses its flavor. And see, I don't want to lose my flavor, amen? <laughs> I'm sweet and salty. And then he says this most importantly, because people are hearing him getting ready to shake up some things that they've been hearing their whole life. And he says, do not think that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I came to fulfill the law. Amen? And then he goes on and he says, you have heard that it was said. And he starts talking and going down the line about murder and about adultery and about different things in marriage. And he starts going on and on and he tells them all this. And then he says this, but I tell you. See, you've heard it said, but I tell you. There's a choice to choose who you listen to. So who are you listening to? Because he's saying, you've heard the laws of old, but I'm telling you that there's more to it. The Bible tells us in the Ten Commandments that you shall not murder. But there's more to that. He then says, even if you think about it in your heart, you're in danger. Adultery. All we know is, is don't commit adultery. But he says, even if you look at a woman lustfully, it's better that you gouge out your eye. I've seen a lot of people with one eye patch. I wonder. <laughs> it's funny because this, this morning I started reading this and I'm preparing and my left eye started burning. I said, Lord, I've been looking at my wife only. I promise. <laughs> I need both of them. This is why when you pray, you, you repent. Remember that. Anyways. But he started saying all these things, and the whole point he was saying was, listen to what I'm telling you, but then go and be doers. Walk in it. So you can hear a word and not be a doer of a word, and it only falls on what's called deaf ears. Deaf ears is when you hear something, but you don't go and do or apply what God has actually called you to do. You see, you have to understand that he's giving instructions to those that want to hear. How many of you in here want to hear today? There we go. Everybody wants to hear, right? He's saying, then do these things because when you do these things, you're preparing for the life I've called you to. See, when you act on these things, you're making preparation for his will to be done in your life. So I'm going to ask you this one question today. How's your preparation? Think about that. How is your preparation? Because everything requires preparation. People go, everything, pastor? Did you get up in the morning? Yeah, did you go to the bathroom? Yeah. Guess what? You had to get up. And then you had to prepare to walk. Everything that you do requires it. Did you brush your teeth? You need toothpaste, a toothbrush, and you need water. And you need hot. Some need hot water. Lord Jesus, be with them. You need to know how. You need to know how to brush your teeth. Because if you just put it in there and go, and done. <laughs> You're going to have a lot of people wearing those eye patches over their nose. But everything requires preparation. And it's funny that today is Cookie Sunday. And I know a lot of it took preparation. But this word was before Cookie Sunday. And God was working on me. And I said, how good and fitting is it that it's Cookie Sunday? Because you know how much preparation goes into making cookies, right? First, you got to get in the car. You got to drive to the store. Then you got to go and pick up all the ingredients for what you're going to make. Then you got to prepare it, and as you're preparing it, you got to preheat the oven. And then as you preheat the oven, you got to make sure you have it just right at the right temperature, right? You have to know the instructions. You have to follow them. Because that one time I told you about Jeremy not following instructions with me, they were still good, but that's because God's good. Amen? He ain't never let me down. <laughs> he, sorry. But today, I got to tell you, I got to tell you, we took preparation and we made the cookies the right way this time. But it takes preparation. When you're preparing your cookies, you have to make sure that it tastes right. You have to make sure that you don't miss a step. I'm going to get to that in a minute. But everything takes preparation. You see, I started playing football when I went to high school. And it's funny because when I got there, I didn't know how to play football. I've tried to play a little bit, you know, here and there in the streets and different things. But I didn't know all the plays that go into playing football and all of the requirements that it takes to be able to run and to do everything. And see, the coach says, I have to evaluate you to see what position I'm putting you in. 
And so we went to these things called two-a-days. How many of you guys ever played football or sports? Two-a-days are before school starts, two times a day. You'd go in the morning, you'd go in the afternoon. And you would work out and you would play for the coach any position he tells you. Most of the time they make us run. And as he's running, he's checking to see who's the fastest. He's trying to see who pays the most attention when they're running. He would tell us, everybody cut right. Whoever could cut right might be the better what? Running back. Oh, maybe they'd be a good defensive end if they were able to get off the line faster. He was evaluating each and every one of us for the purpose of putting us in the game. But we couldn't just start playing the game. We had to go to practice. So we were preparing to play the game. And as we were doing so, he said, you know what you need? You need pads. You need to put on those pads to protect yourself. You also need to put on the right shoes because if you don't have cleats on, see this one time, I love telling stories, so just bear with me. I'm going to preach in a minute. But I had Iz come over with me to go play some football, right? I used to coach I-9 football, and it was raining. And all the kids had cleats, but I missed a kid. I was like, yo, can I throw Iz in to play? They were like, yeah, he can play, but he had regular sneakers. And Iz is an amazing running back, but with the right shoes. Because the minute he got out there, he was trying to run, swoop, he slipped, he fell. He got back up, he was like, oh! He was so mad because he's so good, but he wasn't what? Prepared. It wasn't his fault. I should have bought him some shoes because he could've, we could have won. My bad, my bad. But see, when you play football, you have to be prepared. Everything you do in life requires preparation. Amen? Now, there is this time when you may over-prepare. That's whenever you go on trips with my dad. I love you, Dad, if you're listening. But my dad... Let's just put it like this. We were going on a two-day trip, and my dad says, I think we need to rent a 15-passenger van. I said, for what, Dad? He said, just in case. So if any of you know me, I'm overprepared because just in case. But what happened was is he's like, take out the last three rows of the 15-passenger van, and we're going to take six to ten of everything for two days. Because you never know with my dad what's going to happen. Even though you, you know you're just going for two days, right? But it so happened this one time. It's always one time. That one time when we got stuck in the rain, my dad's like, I think I got a poncho for that. How many you got? I got six of them. Overprepared. No, he was readily prepared. Yeah, everybody now is going to be like, I'm going to get a... No, I'm not going to do all that. You don't need to over-prepare. That's why some of you think I'm over-prepared. Because of my dad. But I'm grateful because that one time I wasn't wet. I was dry. All the other times I just had to unload a lot of stuff and load it back up for no reason. But it taught me that I could be prepared in and out of season. Amen? See, because God calls us to be prepared in and out of season. You have to be ready to give account for something if ever asked for it. So that's why my dad said, I've got it. He over-prepares. Sometimes we need to over-prepare. But the truth is, if you're not going to even prepare, it's like saying, I see the storm coming, but I think I'm good. I'm going to just take my chances. I think the sand looks nice because I love the beach. So I think I'll just build a house here. I won't evaluate the soil. You see, but I love how Jesus ends his sermon on the mount because he says to them, after all these things, if you're like a hearer of the word and you're likened unto a man who is what? wise or foolish. You have to be a hearer and a doer of the word. Amen? But see, there's two accounts given. Matthew is the one that we read because everybody reads Matthew first. Just because it's first in the book and the way that he says it, that he built this house upon a rock. But Luke, everybody say Luke. 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 Luke said it a little bit different. Luke says like this, and he says the very similar thing, but he says two very important points. He says, and I overlooked this. This is sad. This is why I said when you read your Bible, it pops out at you. Because I've read this over and over again, and I've heard the accounts, and every time you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all give almost similar accounts to things. But you learn something new in each one. And it's because you're listening and you're preparing to hear what God has to say to you. And this is what he says. He says, he is like a man building a house who dug deep, and he laid the foundation of the rock. See, the other one just says, and he built his house upon a rock. Luke says that he dug deep. Somebody, somebody needs to hear that Luke's telling you, you got to go deeper. You need to go deeper. See, because I don't know if you've ever tried to lay a foundation before. Any builders in the house? 
Okay, cool. So here's the thing. <laughs> Only Darren. We're in trouble. Everybody get your builder's license. Somebody start learning how to build something. In the name of Jesus. Okay. Well, I know how to lay a foundation because I was selling land one time. And when I was selling this land, I learned what everybody else knew how to do to prepare the foundation. Did you guys know that there's steps to building a foundation before you just build a house? Let me explain it. That's right. You got to do a survey of the land. You have to first look to see where you're going to put the house. Then once you determine where you're going to put the house, you have to do what's called a soil study and a depth test. See, Luke knew what he was talking about. You got to go deeper because they had to go down and see where does the rock begin? Now in Florida, we're six feet underground. We're six feet under sea level. So that means he was digging and he hit the ocean down here, right? If you build it on the beach, you will hit the ocean. That's why, long story short, if you build on the beach, they shoot down these tools that shoot into the ground and they shoot out like this and they pour concrete immediately. And it's concrete that can hold up against water and it goes 20 feet down. So that if you're ever on the beach and you're in one of those big tall buildings, you can feel safe going up an elevator. So much so that the Porsche design building said you can take a car up the elevator while you're on the beach. <laughs> That's why I'm not buying a Porsche there. I will buy a Porsche. I'm just not going to go there. Because when the storm came, and when, no, just. The thing is, you got to go 20 feet plus with the, y'all, just whatever, just look it up. But see, we had to do a soil study and a depth test. And we had to determine two things. What kind of rock is there and how far is it? Then we had to determine what kind of soil settled there. I keep doing this because I'm like, those are little pointers. You better be taking notes. And then once we had the results of this test, we learned at this land that it was unsuitable soil for building. Ah, so now what do we got to do? Well, here's the process. First, you have to demuck it. Anybody know what demuck means? That means to get all the junk out. Oh, wow, this is kind of like us. Maybe God's trying to say, wait, we got to get all the junk out. What's settled there? What soil is he evaluating? And what depth is he checking for the rock, the foundation that's built on inside of you? So it had to be demucked. You see, this was the removing of, you have heard it was said. This is the way of old. This is the way that you've always heard it. And then he goes, the next step has to be what we do, which is called refill. You have to refill it with soil and new rock. You see, once you refill it and put it with soil, everybody thinks, oh, I'm good. I can build, right? Nope. Because that's just the applying of the but I tell you. Now you have to do something else. So you have to learn to listen and do. Which is why once the land is actually refilled, then you have to roll it. They come over with this big roller. And then they do what's called a stamping. And they stamp it down and they press it down. That's why it's pressed down, shaken together. And it runs over, amen? You think they all just knew how to do this stuff? No, it's from the Bible. You know what I'm talking about. You see, that's not the end of the preparation. It had to do all those steps. Once it was then done, it's level now. And once it's ready for the house pad to be, to be put on, that's not the concrete slab. That's another layer of crushed rock. See, because the house is built on the rock. Building is learning how to read the Bible. You see, our lives are built upon the rock. But that's only if we're hearers and doers of the word. Because it's likened unto a man, a wise man, who listens and does these things that I say. Once the foundation was poured out, you could start to build your house. But the Bible tells us in Luke, if you're taking notes, Luke 14, 28 through 30, it says to count the cost before you build. You see, a lot of us just want to jump right into it. And if you're not prepared, inflation hits. Oh, that stinking enemy. When you're ready to build the house and the enemy comes in and he's like, I'm going to double the rent on you. I'm going to double the cost on you. I'm going to make your building expenses even higher than anything you can. I'm going to put it through the roof so you can't even put a roof. <laughs> and then you read, for which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first, prepare, preparation, and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it. 
You see, the thing is, is the goal is not about building it. It's about finishing it. Lest after he has laid the foundation. See, because once you lay the foundation, you think you're ready. But here's what happens. You're not able to finish. And all who see it begin to mock him. Saying, this man, be this man began to build and was not able to finish. And he's likened unto the lazy man who had little folding of the hands, a little sleep, and poverty came on him. But see, God is faithful to finish what he started in us, but it's up to us to do something. We have to first prepare for him to do the stuff that he needs to do in our lives. That's why we have to make preparation for him to do it, right? But we need the right preparation in order to what? Survive the storm. You can't just build some wood frame home in the middle of South Florida. We have hurricanes. Now, there's a lot of wood frame homes here. And I, I, make, I, do, I do inspections and I tell people all the time, this is a wood frame home. Yeah, but it's been here since 1950. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Ask Darren. I've sent him out to some homes, and he's like, bro, this is wood frame. You know that? And I'm like, Ugh. I guess it just means you get to fix more, buddy. <laughs> because the winds come and the rains come, right? And see, there's so many different examples in the Bible that we can look to on why preparation matters. And some of you are saying, well, who's, who, who had to pre prepare in the Bible? David, right? He was about ready to face Goliath, and he says, let me go to the brook first. Let me pick up these stones. People are like, that's a giant with full armor and a sword. What are you going to do to him? Let me get my stones, and let me pray. See, his preparation involved prayer. Always preparation involves prayer. And see, just like the wise builder that built his house on the rock, we have to plan to survive. That's why we prepare. You prepare for what God has in store for your life. And check this out. Others in the Bible did the same thing. Noah. Noah prepared for a flood that he had never known was coming because of rain that never happened. Many people believe that it never rained from the days of Adam until Noah. So they didn't know what rain was. Isn't that crazy? We live in South Florida. We see it every summer. Every day. A 30% chance is going to rain right here. Okay, cool. That's 30% of the area. I'm not going to be in it. And then like 10 minutes later, it's sunny. Five seconds later, it's raining next to you. It happened. Literally at my house. My neighbor's house was dry. My house was there. I was like, God, did I ask for a Gideon moment? <laughs> Are you calling me to lead them? For the Lord. No, I'm sorry. Hey, I'm over prepared just in case. I got a trumpet and I got a lighter. I might annoy my neighbors, but whatever. It's okay. But there's one person who had to do extra preparation. When I talk about over-prepare, right, there's one person who did a lot of extra preparing for a special moment. Her name was Esther. Now, here's the thing. As I was trying to prepare on which one I was going to talk about, <laughs> I want to talk about everybody in the Bible. I read half the Bible. And so I read all of Esther. It's only 10 chapters. I challenge you to read this because what I'm going to cover today is only a part of it, but it's an amazing story. You see, she had to complete 12 months of preparation. We can't even prepare five minutes to do some cookies in the, in, before we get distracted. 12 months of nothing but preparation. Why was she preparing? You see, the story goes like this. That Mordecai, he was a Jew that lived in the land of King Xerxes. And while he was there... He had to take care of Esther because her parents passed away, and all of a sudden she was orphaned. So he took her in, and he brought her to the land where it just so happened that Queen Vashti, she got her attitude. She was like, I ain't going to bow down to no man. I ain't going to honor my king. You got to go read it. It's crazy. It's just like a movie. It's like a, it's like a soap opera, too. <laughs> it's like the young and the, no. the, young and the ridiculous. So Queen Vashti, she acts up in front of all these people. You know, it's like, he, he's like, he's like, bow down before me, queen, in front of all the people. She's like, Psst, no. <laughs> Just like that. And all of a sudden he goes, I banish you. I'm going to look for a new queen. You know, you don't mess with a king like that, right? So all of a sudden, one of his officials goes, how about you get all of the beautiful virgins together that they can come before you and you pick a new wife for yourself? And it just so happens that Mordecai had her there so Esther became one of the virgins chosen to go before the king. But the rule was, according to regulations for women to be presented to the king, 12 months must be completed of preparation. How did it happen? 
Six months, she sat in an oil bath off and on of myrrh. Her skin must have been like smooth, like shiny. You ain't got no ashy elbows, knees, head, shoulders, toes, nothing. Imagine you have six months to just sit around in oil. I mean, I was like, you could probably fry an egg on her, you know what I'm saying? But it was myrrh. You don't cook with myrrh. You cook with vegetable oil. That's because I made some cookies. <laughs> you know, y'all know. You don't know. My daughter did bake them, but there's a competition between us. And just so you know, she has some cookies back there, but so do me and Jeremy. And I love all the judges. It's too late. Oh, man. For those of you that don't know, we're having a competition today on the, on the cookies. <laughs> I already know mine's chosen because God has favor. Amen. Okay. $20 outside if you got the one. Okay. Anyways, back to the message. This, this is important. This is important. Six months of myrrh that she was in, this oil. But then that's only six months of the 12. The other six months she was bathed in and put on perfumes and beautifying of women. This is what it says that they had to beautify her and put on all this perfume so that when she would walk by the king, she would do her little walk. I don't know, you know what I'm saying? Like, if I was like, I'd be like, but I ain't no chick, you know what I'm saying? She walked by. I don't know how she did it. She's like, hi, king. <laughs> Six months, baby. You smell that? Right? She was ready. She was ready for him if he wanted her. And it says that she was so ready that as she went in, she did all the things that she was told to do, and she gained favor with everyone in the house. And then that one day, she was walking by, and the king looked over at her and caught her eye, and he said, I'm going to make her my queen. Not only am I going to make her my queen, I want you to put the robe on her, crown her, and I'm extending my gold scepter. You see, the gold scepter is important because that means I'm accepting only her. Only when he extends the scepter is you, are you accepted. And she comes in and she's placed in the kingdom as the queen next to King Xerxes. Now, some people say, why was she there as the queen? Why is Esther in the Bible? It's because she was called for something greater than just being the queen. She had preparation for a purpose. You see... Imagine she missed a step. Just imagine for one second, she missed a step and wasn't chosen by the king. Do you know that her people would have suffered because she didn't do everything? I'm only going to do eight months today. Ugh. I got lazy. I got tired of doing it. I wasn't feeling it. Let me see. I'm never going to let you down but I don't want to serve you today, God, so maybe just today, give me a minute. This is what we do. So many times we forget to put the most ingredient, the most important ingredient into something because we miss a step. Imagine you missed a step on these cookies. It could cost you the prize. <laughs> I'm not hoping that on anybody. I'm just saying, if you didn't bathe for 12 months in your cookie oil, just imagine what would happen to you. It could cost you the salvation of your people. Not the cookies. But here's what happens. Esther is in place when Mordecai discovers that a man in the king's palace wants to kill all of the Jews. And see, it's, it's amazing because Esther was a Jew among all the Persians. And there was a decree put out by this man named Haman. He says, I want to kill all the Jews. Why? Because Mordecai didn't bow down to him. Mordecai said, I'm not bowing down to you. And because he didn't do that, Haman came up with a plan to kill all the Jews. Oh, they're all defying us. They're defying the kingdoms. So he sent out a decree to kill everybody who was a Jew on a certain day. And on this certain day, everybody would have free reign to go and attack them. But word got back to Mordecai. And Mordecai goes, Esther, I need you to do something for us. You need to save your people. You've been placed in a position and you have influence. I need you to use your influence. She said, do you know what happens when you walk into a king and you ask for something without him giving you the scepter? It's off with your head. He could have you killed in a moment. He said, 
I'm going to go and pray, and I'm going to fast. And so he called for a prayer and fast of all the Jews of the land. And they prayed and fasted. And she prayed and fasted. And she sent a word back. She said, I'm going to go to the king for my people, but I need you to pray hard. See, if they were just hearers of the word and nobody was doing it, who knows what the outcome would have been. But the Bible tells us that she walks up to the king and she says, if it pleases the king, may I present something? He says, anything you want up to the half of the kingdom is yours. She must have smelled really good. Because I tell Evie all the time, I tell my wife, I'm like, anything you want up to $10 is yours. She smells great. And I love you, baby. And you can have my whole kingdom. Backtrack, backtrack. Baby, I love you. You can have everything. He only gave her half the kingdom. I'll give you my whole kingdom. <laughs> so she walks up and she asks, can I have a banquet for the king? Oh, for me? Yes, and your officials. Bring Haman. So she prepares this banquet and he goes, what is your request? She goes, no, 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 not yet, not yet, not yet, not yet. I want you to go read the whole story. You got to read this. It's crazy. She goes, one more day, one more day. I want to just honor you, king. I want to honor you. Oh, you love me. Yes, sure, sure, sure. And Haman, I want just Haman and I want just the king. Just Haman and the king now. Not all your officials, just him. Haman was like, wow, I must be special. Mordecai sees him again, and Haman goes, I'm extra special, bow to me. He doesn't bow down. And Haman was planning to kill the Jews, but he wanted to make a special point of Mordecai, which actually happened to be her uncle. And here's the thing. He erected this 50-foot pole. And at the time in the Bible, they would actually impale people and leave them on the pole for you to see a sign of what the king and those who disrespect the king are honored like. And so he said, I'm going to go and I'm going to get Mordecai and I'm going to do this to him. But I'm going to do it after the banquet. You got to read it. You got to read it. The banquet comes and the king says, I told you to present to me. What is it that you want? And all her preparation, she's ready. Here she goes. She says, King, I want to make a request that you save my people. And he goes, save your people? What do you mean? She goes, I'm a Jewish person. And you put out a decree. Who put out this decree? Who said they're going to kill you and your people? Haman? Oh, really, Haman? You going after my wife? <laughs> Take him to that 50-foot pole for Mordecai and put him on it. Later on, him and his whole family. You got to read it. It's crazy. She ended up being the savior of her people. Why? Because she chose to prepare for that moment that God had called her to. Are you preparing for the moment that God is calling you to? You see, another example that we're given is ten virgins. There were five wise and five foolish. It's funny how there's wise and foolish people. The wise people prepare, the foolish people don't. And it says that while they were there, they heard it said. They heard it said. Go and prepare your lamps. So they got their lamps, but I tell you, make sure you have extra oil. You see, they didn't have the extra oil. Five of them didn't. Five did. And all of a sudden, when the, when the bridegroom came, they were saying, oh, I hear he's coming, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. Can we get some extra oil? Our lamps are about to go out. No, we can't give it to you. Why? Because if we give you ours, then we run out, and we won't be ready. So go and buy some. So they sent the five virgins to go and buy some, and guess what happened at that time when they were buying it? The bridegroom came. He came. And when they came back with their oil and their lamps looking for him, it was too late. He had already come. You see, if this was modern day time, you'd be in trouble. Because the Bible tells us that it came at a call at midnight. That the bridegroom has come. Now come and meet him. You see, there are no more 24-hour oil marts open. They all close at 11. Walmart. Oh, never mind. There's no more oil marts open. And so if you were looking for your oil, you would miss the calling that God had for you in that moment to come to me. Because you're too busy staying busy with the things of this world that you're not preparing. This is why preparation is important. The oil is important. See, the Bible was saying that these five asked, please give us something, anything, anything at all. 
but there was nothing to give because you have to be prepared for yourself. You can't wait for somebody else to come and be ready for you. You have to be prepared. You see, I said to myself this. I said, it's hard to be prepared for something when you don't know what's coming. But if we're already ready, we don't got to get ready. What's that statement? If you stay ready, you don't got to get ready. So I'm asking you this question again. How's your preparation? Evaluate yourself right now. Look at yourself and say, is my preparation for God to be ready? Is it that I'm ready for whatever he has for me? In this moment, he's seeking those who are ready, who's prayed up. But the enemy is also seeking the same ones whom he may devour. He's looking for those who aren't prayed up, who aren't seeking him, who don't know their Bible. He's looking for ways that he can come in and attack you without your armor on to bring you down. So my other question is, have you put on your full armor? Have you chose today to get up and put on the full armor of God? Or are you like, I'm just going to put on three pieces. That should be enough. I don't want to put on the whole armor of God. I'm just going to walk around and I'm just going to cover myself. I don't need my shield of faith today or my helmet of salvation. I'm just good enough knowing the truth. I'm going to put my belt on. I can be righteous. I'm going to put my breastplate on. And I know the word of God for what I know of it because I've only studied it. So I'm going to put on my peace. I'm going to just walk around with this today. Yet the enemy shoots off these fiery darts against you, it says. And you know what the shield is for? It's your first line of defense to block off these fiery things. It says that the shields were dipped in water and they were leather. This is how they prepared their shields. So that when the fiery darts would hit from the enemies, it would extinguish it. If you don't have your shield of faith, believing that what you put up in front of you to block anything that the enemy brings, you're not prepared for it. See, if you only put on half the armor, you're only half prepared. The helmet of salvation is where the mind is. This is where the battlefield begins. The enemy starts telling you things like you're not good enough. You can't exceed in that. You're not ready. You didn't fully prepare. I'm coming to attack you. Your mind is the battlefield. And if you're not prepared for it because you didn't put on the whole armor of God, you only get half of the coverage. You see, today you need to ask, am I prepared? Seriously, ask yourself, am I prepared? Have I laid the right foundation? Because if not, when God comes back, you're not prepared. It may be too late for you. You see, I started reading again and I said, it's not just me that has to prepare, it's my family. Have you prepared your family to walk in the will of the Lord? That doesn't mean that I just make sure my kids are just doing the right things. No, I need to make sure that they're accountable and that I'm accountable to them and they're accountable to me. So much so that when we tell our kids, have you done your devotion lately? They go, oh, yeah, 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 I've done my devotion or this. Have you read your Bible lately? Have you cleaned your room? These are things that I'm making sure that they're preparing to do the right things. And then they come up and they ask me, hey, I have a question for you. Do you know where this is in the Bible? Because I have this question. You know, a lot of times my son comes up to me and he's like, hey, I'm playing online and somebody just questioned this about God. Do you know the answer I should give to this? Imagine I wasn't prepared. What would I have shown my son that it's important for me to not know these things or it's important for me to know these things. So in that moment, I was able to give him an answer because I was prepared. And so because he sees this, he knows what to do and walk in righteousness. But the world is trying to tell you to do something different. They don't want you to prepare. They want you to stand around and be what? Lazy. But see, in this season, this time, we have to remember that they also want to try and take away somebody important from us which is Jesus. They want to try and put all these other things in front of them. But if we already know our Bible, we know that this is the season that we celebrate Jesus Christ. He's the reason for the season. We know it's not about his birth and this specific date, but this is when we honor him. So we don't let other people take away our opportunity to honor the son, right? We have to take the opportunity to say, it's not about this guy in a red suit. It's not about these sweets, even though I love the sweets all the time. And it's not about all the presents. It's more about his presence. There's a reason that we celebrate the season. It's the sun. Amen? Amen? You see, in this time, we have to remember that Jesus took something on as a child. He didn't just come into this world as a baby for just to, to be a baby. He came as a baby to prepare the way for us to have what? Salvation. I was waiting for it. I knew you guys knew because everybody knows the word. He was waiting for us to be prepared for his salvation because he came as a baby. He prepared all that time. But imagine he missed one step. Imagine he chose in that moment when he said, take this cup from me. And God said, okay, cool, I'll take it from you. We would still be living under sin. But see, he didn't. He stayed the course because he wanted to save his people. 
He went through preparation. He went through everything that he had to do so that we would have a promise of tomorrow. And it says that we should be focused on God and what Jesus is doing in our lives. And you see, there's a story that I read, and it's a sad story. And I want to share it with you for a minute because it hit me. I said, are the things of this world more important than the promises of God? And where is our heart lying? Because if we look at the things of this world, we desire only what they have versus the Son. You see, there's a story that goes like this, that there was a rich man who devoted his life to finding all of the wealthiest and nicest pieces of art that he could collect. He had Van Gogh and Picasso, and he had all of those Monets. He had all the nice stuff that everybody desired to have in museums, but he had it up in his wall. And one day, he was teaching his son about art, and he became so proud of his son because his son became an expert art collector. And they collected all this art from around the world. But it was at a time when the world was at war, and the war engulfed his area, and all of a sudden, guess what happened? He had to go to war. So as his son went off to war, two weeks later, he hears that he had died in the front lines. His best friend, who had helped him collect all of these artworks that they, honor, they, they love to look at together, passed away in the war. And all of a sudden, here's what happens. It says that the telegram comes back that he was, he was killed in the line of duty by carrying somebody to the medic. He was saving one of his friends. He risked his life. He gave up his life for others, trying to take them to be healed. This widowed man was saddened. But on Christmas morning, a door knock, knock, knock came. He opened it up, and there was a man holding a large package in his hand. And he said, excuse me, sir, I was a soldier, and I knew your son, and I have a present for you. Is it okay if I come in? So he welcomes him in. And this man is holding a big painting. And he says, I was the soldier that your son carried to the medic. And I'm an artist. And I painted something that I want to give you. And as the son was carrying him there, I'm sure he imagined how his face looked and his personality. So much so that he put it into the painting. So that as the dad pulls off the cover, he sees the picture of his son's face in detail. Showing the passion and the personality that the son had. Every detail was there, and the dad broke down crying. It says, though, that a little bit later, he passed away because he got an illness. And there was this word that was out that in his will, all of the paintings were to be auctioned off. And all these paintings that were going to be auctioned off made it to the world that they were going to have a chance to get the museum list paintings. So they get up to the auction, and everybody's there. And the auctioneer stands up and says, we're going to start it off with this painting. And it's a picture of his son. And you hear from the background complete silence when he says, do I have $100? And somebody yells, forget that painting. We don't want the son. We want everything else. We didn't come for that. We came for all the good paintings. Nobody wants the son. Yeah, give us everything else. But the auctioneer said, no. This piece must sell first. Who's going to give me $100? Silence completely fell. A man in the back goes, I knew the father. I knew the son. I'd like to go ahead and buy that. I'll give $100. Is there no one else that would give any more than $100? Let him have it. So the man gets the $100. The gavel goes. The auction's closed. There are no more sales. Everybody erupted. What do you mean there's no more sales? What about all the pieces? According to the will, whoever bought the son gets it all. You see, according to the will of the Father, it is the greatest gift, which is what we represent during this time, during Christmas, that whoever takes the son gets it all. Are you preparing to get it all? Or are you just looking for everything else in this world that they have to offer? You see, I want to walk out of here knowing today that my church, that the people I know are following God's will and are prepared. Because here's why. Your preparation affects your presentation. If you didn't take the time to make a good presentation, and if we're grading on presentation and your cookies don't look good, you did not win. Straight up. Get that out of here. It may taste good, but you don't look good. 
You might be that weak-eyed one I've talked about in the past. <laughs> Cookie all deflated, looking like you're missing some chocolate chips in it. Because your preparation affects your presentation. See, it's important that we know. Come on. We can have fun, right, guys? We're about to eat some cookies. Come on. It ain't about the cookies. It's about the sun. Whoever wins the cookies wins it all. No. Whoever wins Jesus wins it all. That's what it's about. But that's the sweet thing that we have. That's why we did sweets today. But see, when you walk out of this door today, people are going to see your presentation based on your preparation. Now, I want to know. Is your presentation going to look like a wise man built it or a foolish man? Are they going to see a house that was built on the rock, stood the test of time, is still walking in the things of the Lord against all the storms and the attacks of the enemy? Or are they going to see a broken, battered, beaten home about to fall? Not just any fall, a great fall. Are they going to walk by and say, hmm, that vineyard doesn't look like anybody cared or knew what to do? You see, did you build your house on the shaky ground? Psalms 18, 1, 3 says this. I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer. My God, my strength, in whom I will trust. My shield and my salvation. This is why you don't miss the shield of the salvation. My stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. And so shall I be saved from my enemies. If you don't know that verse and you don't recite that verse, and you don't say, Lord, be my shield, be my salvation, be my stronghold. Lord, I'm asking you to go before me. Let me get some keys. Where are you at? Come on, let me get some keys. Oh, he's eating the cookies in the back. I don't need no keys. Forget the keys. We're good. Here's what happens. If you're not built on the chief cornerstone, then everything crumbles. Because you're not building it on what? The sinner. The sinner, when I say the chief cornerstone, even though it's on the corner of the building that holds everything together, he needs to be the center of our lives. If he's not at the center of our lives, when they go to do inspect that soil, when they go to inspect that ground to see if it's shaky or if it's solid, they're going to know whether or not your presentation was based off of your great preparation or your failed preparation. So today I ask you this one question. How's your preparation? Are you prepared for what God has for you? Have you already set inside of your soul, I'm going to do what I need to do to take care of my house? Or are you just going through the motions right now? Because if all you're doing is going through the motions, then you've already missed the whole point of preparing for what God has for you. See, because he's called you. He says that I've called you and I've appointed you to a time and a place. But if you don't choose to walk in that thing, then you're missing your calling. And see, a lot of us miss the calling because we're too busy on the phone and we think, oh, I can't take that call. I can't take what's being called to me, what's being called of me, because you're not listening. You're hearing, but it's falling on deaf ears. So today, how's your preparation? Have you taken the time to say, God, move everything out of the way. Take everything that's not good in me. Demuck my life. Take out all the nasty, settled soil. Remove all the thistles and the thorns. Take away everything that tries to hinder and so easily besets us. And let us run. Because here's something that I had a challenge with. On Wednesday night, Pastor Ariel said, what are you chasing? And I told him, I said, I'm so tired of chasing the things of this world. Remember this? I said, I'm so tired of chasing the things of this world that I let it get in the way of reading my word. I let it get in the way of preparing my family for what's coming. You see, I've been having conversations with people and everybody's like, man, I've been noticing this and I've been noticing that and I've been seeing this. I said, what are you preparing for? Have you been preparing? And they're like, no, but I'm just looking. You can't just look and expect ready to take on what's coming. You have to prepare for it. I said, look, the Bible tells us to look up until the heavens, right? For the sky to crack. If nobody's preparing to look up, you're going to miss it because you're always looking down. Today, somebody needs to prepare to change the way that they look at things. They need to change the way that their heart responds to things. So my challenge is, how's your preparation? Have you prepared what God has called you to do? I'm going to pray for you. And I'm going to pray that God would work on you and that today your preparation would change. That when they walk out of here, you look like a bunch of wise builders because you know how to lay the foundation today. Because you took and applied the word that you heard. Because, but I tell you, 
you have to know what it is that he tells you and walk in it. Amen? Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for everything that you've done in our lives, for everything you're doing even now, for everything you're shaking up inside of us, Lord Jesus. Take it out of us, Lord Jesus, all of this stuff, this hindrance that's keeping us from what you've prepared for us. Lord, I pray that we would walk in the preparation of your word. That, Lord, as we study and we prepare, we prepare, Lord Jesus, that you would give us the ability to say what it is, Lord, that you need us to say to those who are lost in this world, to those who are hurting and looking for an answer, Lord. And we know the answer. We have it. Let us be willing to give it to those freely, Jesus. I pray today that as we prepare, Lord Jesus, we would open up a door for you to come in. Lord, we seek you completely. We chase after you today, Lord. We ask you to have your way in this place and in our lives. And, Lord, I say today, Lord, that you would bless every person here today that hears these words and doesn't just listen to them, but does them. Lord, that they would become wise builders in you and that they would build on this foundation, which is the rock. Today, Lord, I give everything to you and I say thank you for who you are, for what you've done and what you're about to do in our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I decided to keep it short and sweet because we got some sweets. And I thought it would be kind of neat. I ain't a poet, but I know it. I'm a poet. But here's what's important. And I saved this for the best part. I didn't talk about preparation in your giving because there's a time for it right now. But many of us prepare what we're going to give before we come. Sometimes we go, I know I made this much money today. And you guys already know I say this every time. It's not about your money until it is. And here's where it is. You can take the time to put all the money into buying all the ingredients to make cookies, but you can't bring an offering or a blessing to the Lord's house because I had to put it all in cookies so that I could win a prize. You see, God doesn't ask you to give your money so that you can receive a reward. He asks you to give it because it's what we desire. And he says, no, I want to give you the desires of your heart. So today, here's what I ask you. Who's desiring in their heart to give more to God, but you just haven't prepared for it? Maybe now's the time that you change your preparation and your giving. And you say, God, I want to give more cheerfully. I want to give more freely, Lord. I want to be blessed to be a blessing. Whatever it is that you've considered in your heart to give, there's ways you can give. You can give a person. So if that's you right now and you're changing your preparation, you need something right now, there's envelopes. Raise your hand. If not, you can give online. But don't get distracted during this time. Make sure that you give to God what you've set in your heart, but also let him speak to you. Amen? Let's pray for that. Dear God, I thank you for the opportunity to give to you right now. I pray for this offering, Lord, that it wouldn't just be something that we give just out of a begrudging attitude, Lord Jesus, out of an attitude of grudge, we hold it, but unbegrudgingly, Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for everything you've blessed us with. We thank you for the ability to even give to you, Lord, because we know it's an act of worship. So I pray today that you would bless the giver, Lord, those who have the ability to give and those who don't, that you bless them the same so that they can give to you, Lord, when the time comes. And I pray that you would just press it together, shake it together, Lord Jesus, that you would just let it overflow in our lives, the blessings that come from you. And we can only give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor. In your name we pray. Amen.